Uh, my name's Sam Chikoskin. I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager here at Wound Care today. And I'm just going to run through a couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started with today's session. Uh, so the session tonight is titled Antimicrobial Resistance and Stewardship, What You Need to Know. And uh, the event is sponsored by ST as well. So a big thank you to them for their support. Uh, we do really appreciate it. Uh, our speakers tonight are Dr. Karen Alsi and Kate Williams, who I will introduce in a, in a moment. Um, welcome both, uh, and thank you for uh, for your commitment to uh, to doing this event with us tonight. We do appreciate it as well. Uh, certificates will be available at the end of the session, so I'll give the link at the end of there. Uh, do bear with us if there are any technical issues. We are recording this <coughs> remotely, so uh, if there is any issue, then our team will be in the comments section to help uh, explain and guide you through any of that. Also in the comments section, do get involved with the live Q&A. So at the end of the session, we'll have about 15 minutes of questions. I'll be asking the questions to Karen and Kate. So please leave as many questions you've got for, for both speakers in the uh, comments section, and we'll get through as many as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all from me. So enjoy the session. I'll see you all shortly. Thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Karen. Thanks, Sam, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening, and thank you to ST for sponsoring us. So, as Sam said, we're going to discuss antimicrobial resistance and stewardship, what you need to know. I'm Karen Uzi, I'm Professor of Skin Integrity at the University of Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. I'm also Chair of the International Wound Infection Institute, President-elect for the International Skin Tears Advisory Panel, and I'm also the co-chair of the new Commonwealth Wound Care Resource Alliance. And antimicrobial resistance and stewardship is very much embedded into all those organisations as well. So it isn't just a national issue, it's very much an international issue. So by the end of this session, you should understand the role of antimicrobial resistance in wound care. Have an awareness of the difference between wound inflammation and wound infection. Be able to explore practical solutions to managing wound infection in clinical practice and be able to discuss the value of ongoing clinical education and combating antimicrobial resistance. So first of all, I just want to go over what is antimicrobial resistance and I'm sure many of you already know, but it's always good just to remind ourselves. So it's nothing new at all. The World Health Organization has been discussing antimicrobial resistance for many years, and they've got lots of free resources as well online if you want to have a look at what we're doing globally to help prevent this crisis. But antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, happens when microorganisms change when they're exposed to antimicrobial drugs. And that's not just antibiotics, remember, it's your antifungals, anti antivirals and antimalarials as well. So antimicrobial resistance is very much an umbrella term that incorporates all those areas. And what then happens is those microorganisms or the bugs develop this resistance. And you may have heard it being referred to as the superbug. And you'll have seen this is what the media generally talks about, these superbugs that are beginning to kill people. But why is it important in wound management and wound care? Well, we all know that any break to the integrity of the skin is a wound, however small. We often think of wounds as being quite large, but it's just a cut on the finger as well. So your normal paper cut is a break in that integrity. So that's a wound. And once you've broken that integrity, that allows microorganisms into the body, which can cause antibiotic resistance bacteria. So you can see it's not something to worry about just in a hospital environment or a community environment where you're caring for your patients, it's everyday life as well. And as I was saying, WHO, the World Health Organization, have been very, very vocal about antimicrobial resistance for probably the last decade but for some reason, we haven't actually talked about it in great depth within wound management. So if you go onto the WHO website, you can see they've got all these different strategy documents that talk about how to manage antimicrobial resistance, what we need to think about, and how to do community-based surveillance as well. So we know which antimicrobials we're using, how often, and for how long. 
The World Health Organization have also developed a curriculum that can be used either in clinical areas, be it in the acute side or the community side and in higher education institutions about antimicrobial resistance. And again, you can download that free of charge. But the media have been talking about antimicrobial resistance more and more recently, and it's been identified as being the new pandemic. And they're very keen to try and get the general public to realize that we shouldn't be using antibiotics quite as often as we do now. Obviously, we've got to use them if it's appropriate, but not for patients to be having them for months and years on end. You can see there's lots of comment pieces here about antibiotic resistance has a language problem. And you've probably noticed that I've talked about antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial resistance. So we do need to start all using the same term. And if we use antimicrobial resistance, that covers everything, those antibiotics, antifungals, and your antimicrobial wound dressings as well. But you're probably thinking, well, should we be concerned? I only use antimicrobials when the wound is infected. But when we look at the facts and figures, it is really quite surprising. Antimicrobial resistance is a leading cause of death globally. And there's more deaths as a result of AMR than as a result of HIV, AIDS or malaria. And globally, AMR is responsible for at least 1.27 million deaths annually. And quite frighteningly, one in five of those deaths are in children under the age of five. So you can really see it is really it is quite a serious concern that we all need to be thinking about. And the United Nations have produced lots of really nice infographics as well, one of which you can see now on the screen that talks about the impacts of antimicrobial resistance and how we need to think about it holistically. So we need to think about the misuse and overuse of antimicrobials and the poor access to quality affordable medicines within humans. And remember, we're not just talking about the Western countries here, we're talking about low middle income countries as well, where it's sometimes very difficult to get access to clean water, to be able to get medicines, but sometimes as well in some low middle income countries, and other countries, you can go straight into a chemist and buy antibiotics over the counter. So we're not able then to see how often they're being used and for how long and for what reasons. There's also, we've got to think about food and the animal chain as well, where there can be an overuse of antimicrobials there. And again, thinking about what do we spray our plants and crops with? Because anything that is antibiotic or antimicrobial based, it's going to end up into the food chain. So we need to be very much aware of it. And the best way to prevent antimicrobial resistance is hand washing. If we wash our hands properly, then we know we can reduce infection. And hopefully now people, the general public and everybody realizes the importance of hand washing as we're peri-pandemic at the moment. But if we don't do something now, to tackle antimicrobial resistance, we're going to see in excess of 10 million deaths by 2050, caused as a direct result of antimicrobial resistance. And that's going to cost us in excess of 66 trillion pounds. And that's just increasing daily at the moment, that cost. But those 10 million deaths will be more than the deaths caused by cancer. We'll see just over 8 million cancer deaths by 2050. But we pump lots and lots of money into cancer treatments. We're very much aware about early identification of cancer and prevention of cancer. And we talk about these things in our daily working lives. But just sit back and reflect. You talk about antimicrobial resistance quite as much. And I don't think we do. And again, when we think about antibiotics, we quite happily use our penicillins and tetracyclines. They're your go-to antibiotics but it's been 30 years since a new class of antibiotic has actually been developed. So you can see why these bugs are becoming very clever to evading how an antibiotic should work. Many of the scientists at the moment are trying to develop new antibiotics, but as we speak at the moment, we're reliant on the penicillins and tetracyclines that were developed so many years ago. And when you look at the graph in front of you, 
the first time that we developed penicillins was 1928. So actually you can see why these superbugs have begun to be developed. But we do need something. After me saying to you that probably we're all going to die because of antimicrobial resistance, we need to know how can we manage it? How can we educate people? And nationally, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence has some really excellent documents about managing antimicrobial resistance. But globally as well, we're talking about it. And one way to manage it is by looking at antimicrobial stewardship, which is defined as an organization or a healthcare system-wide approach to promoting and monitoring judicious use of antimicrobials. And you can see that it is everybody's responsibility. So it's not just about nurses, podiatrists or medical staff who are going to be looking at antimicrobial resistance and implementing AMS policies it's everyone's role. We have to ensure infection prevention is involved, pharmacists are involved, GPs are involved, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, operating department practitioners. Anybody that comes into contact with a patient should be aware of antimicrobial stewardship and the policy surrounding it. We also must ensure that we also educate patients and the public as well. Because we know that when a patient has a wound, we may look at wounds every day and think, yes, I have no worries about that wound at all. But a patient doesn't generally look at one every day and worries if it's right, is it infected, is it painful? And we'll often think that they need an antibiotic because it's painful. So we have to ensure that patients understand that you only need your antimicrobials if the wound is infected and neither do they need one of those special wound dressings if the wound isn't infected either. So education is key to everything we do. So we do have to educate all healthcare professionals and we must ensure that we educate patients and the general public as well. And this can be done in a variety of ways. Verbally, as we're doing now through conferences, through seminars, through Facebook Lives, through written material as well, but also sharing resources and letting people know where they can access free online resources that they can sit down and watch and learn from at a time that's suitable to themselves. Many hospital trusts or many communities will have antibiotic lists and this is where our pharmacy colleagues are key. They understand about antimicrobials. So a lot of trusts will have an antibiotic list and we'll say these are the antibiotics you can use. These are the ones you really need to think about. There should also be local guides for diagnostics of infections, including microbiology laboratory tests as well. When do you need to take a wound swab? When do you need to take a tissue biopsy, for example? And when should you then be acting upon the results? And this links into the local guides for your initial antimicrobial therapy. And we shouldn't be using antimicrobials if the patient doesn't have an infection. However, there's always a caveat to that. So some people we don't want, definitely don't want to get an infection who maybe do are in palliative care or have maybe some sort of really poor prognosis. You may then want to use prophylactic antimicrobials for that just in case scenario. We also need local guides for pathogen specific antimicrobial therapy and for surgical prophylaxis as well. So to ensure that the care bundles integrate antimicrobial stewardship policies within them as well. And tools for controlling antibiotic consumption. And that links back to education. And again, if we think about low middle income countries where you can purchase antibiotics over the counter, it's having education tools within the pharmacist as well. So the general public can look at this and see whether or not they really do need that antibiotic. And tools for controlling antimicrobial resistance. So looking at straightforward, easy access to water, hand washing facilities, etc. But before you implement any antimicrobial stewardship policies, can you identify an infection? Do you feel confident that you can recognize infection rather than inflammation? When do you prescribe antimicrobials? Are the policies or are the guidance in your local areas? And where can you get help if you need help? 
And remember, this is all about an interdisciplinary approach. So everybody should be involved and everybody should have some level of education. But there are lots of free resources that link antimicrobial stewardship into wound management. And the Wounds UK Best Practice document of 2020 very nicely identified antimicrobial stewardship in clinical practice for wounds. And one of the tables within there is this one here, which I think is really quite nice. It talks about looking at the wound bed, the amount of exudate, peri-wound skin, which is essential, any odour and wound-related pain. And by looking at this, how can you tell if the wound has improved or deteriorated? So if you've got an increased amount of granulation tissue, for example, lower levels of exudates, the peri-wound skin has very few levels of maceration or erythema, you can think the wound is probably inflamed and there's no infection there. However, if you've got increased amounts of slough, necrotic tissue, maceration, and the patient saying, actually, my wound smells quite a lot and I've got a lot of pain and I feel like I've got a temperature, you would then suspect a wound infection. And then you would think about taking a wound swab. And don't forget when you take a wound swab to clean the wound properly, first of all, and you want to take your wound swab from the cleanest part of the wound using the Levine technique. And if you're thinking, I didn't know about that, or I'm not sure what the Levine technique is, the International Wound Infection Institute has just published the third edition of Wound Infection in Clinical Practice, which is a consensus document that looks at every aspect of wound infection for prevention, early identification, prevention, treatment and management. And embedded within this document is the IWII's Wound Infection Continuum. In 2016, there was a continuum that everybody was using in clinical practice. We have since updated to the one you can see in front of you. And you can see this is really quite easy to use, can be used in clinical practice and can be used for teaching more junior members of staff. So it looks at the different stages of wound infection. So you have contamination, colonization, which is generally normal. You've got your microorganisms are present, no significant host reaction, and there's no delay in the wound healing process. And you think, well, I don't need any antimicrobials there because there's no signs of a wound infection. Whereas you move to local wound infection and we have those covert and overt signs that you will hopefully know about where you've got hypergranulation, erythema, local warm, swelling, and you an increasing pain then you will be thinking about, I need to start using my antimicrobials and then spreading a systemic infection. You would definitely be using your antimicrobials and probably asking for medical assistance as well. We've identified here that as you go through that continuum from contamination to systemic infection, there's an increase in microbial burden within the wound as well. And that's where you have the number of microorganisms will increase and they're influenced by those microorganisms that are present, their growth and the potential virulence mechanisms. But also remember, sometimes you will clean the wound bed, you'll clean it like you mean it, and you'll ensure it looks very nice and clean. But whatever you do, the wound still seems to be stuck and won't heal properly or in a timely manner. That's where you should be considering, is there a biofilm? And then you'd be thinking about biofilm management as well. And to help you with that, the IWII have also produced this pull-out guide, or you can download it from the International Wound Infection Institute's website free of charge, which has that wound infection continuum at the top. We then tell you to be alert for clinical indicators of potential biofilm from colonization upwards. And then think about how you're going to reduce that buyer burden as well. Think about how you're going to cleanse the wound and what you're going to cleanse the wound with. And this will depend on your local guidance and access to cleansing solutions as well. If you're going to take a wound swab, then again, remember, clean that wound bed. Don't be tempted to take a wound swab from the dirtiest, sluffiest area and you confirm your microorganisms and your sensitivities. 
And you think about debridement as per your local guidance and then apply your wound dressing. So your wound dressing is the last thing you think about. You assess that wound bed and your patient first in depth. Think about holistic management all the way through. And don't forget to review and assess your treatment plans regularly to see whether or not you still need your antimicrobials or you can stop your antimicrobials. And at the bottom of here, you can see there's the step down, step up biofilm based approach to wound care as well. And again, remember free to download from the website. But when you're thinking about your wound dressings as well, there are a range of different wound dressings you can choose from. They could be non-medicated or medicated wound dressings. So your medicated dressings will have an active ingredient such as silver. Your non-medicated don't have your active ingredient such as sawback that will pull the bacteria up into the wound dressing itself and keep it off the wound bed. I would also like to point you in the direction of the Lancet paper that was published earlier on this year. And they talked about the global research on antimicrobial resistance. And this is a really good systematic review of the literature, looking at all literature to do with antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. Once the authors addressed this paper, they made a range of recommendations that we all need to have a look at. And they've said we need greater action to monitor and control infections globally, nationally, and within individual hospitals. So think about your antimicrobial stewardship policies. We also need to accelerate support for infection prevention and control, as well as ensuring the whole world has access to vaccines, clean water and sanitation. And to ensure that we optimize use of antibiotics, using them appropriately, both with humans and within the food chain as well. Be very mindful of antimicrobial treatments, so ensuring that we do full in-depth assessments and only use them as appropriate to make, and this is to make sure that we ensure that we have life-saving access to antibiotics that work when we need them, and to act according to the WHO Global Action Plan and the AWARE guidelines, and that we need more funding as well. And NICE in 2018 also published this impact on antimicrobial resistance, where they clearly said that organizations should establish AMS teams and ensure that the team has core members, including antimicrobial pharmacists and a medical microbiologist. They highlight it's best practice to take appropriate microbiological sam samples before antibiotics are used in hospitals, and where appropriate to prescribe antibiotics before the type of infection is confirmed, such as when sepsis is suspected. So all these are really keen, are really keen key to what you need to be doing. And just reflect back on your own practice as to which antimicrobial stewardship policies do you have? Do you know them? Have you read them? And do you know where to find them? So thank you very much for listening and I'll hand over to Kate now. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Karen. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kate Williams. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Huddersfield and I work clinically in Leeds as an honorary tissue viability nurse. So thank you for inviting me today. I've been asked to speak about um, developing a wound infection framework. So this links really nicely into what Karen's been saying about how you might try and implement those national and international documents into your local areas. So what we did, we pondered. So we just thought, why do we need a framework in the first place? Um, so just for the purposes of clarity, we've used the term framework, but some um, organisations use the term pathway. It's the same thing, they're completely interchangeable. So why did we want a framework in the first place? So we wanted to standardise practice and we wanted to reduce variation. But this came about within our trust as part of a much larger piece of work looking at frameworks across the organisation, again, to standardise practice and reduce variations and improve quality. So alongside the wound care related frameworks, so for example, we had a lower limb framework, a pressure ulcer process, 
Um, there was other frameworks developed, um, for example, dementia, delirium. So it wasn't just a wound related thing. This was a much larger piece of work. Um, one of the things we really wanted to emphasize with these frameworks, although standardization is good to, an, to a degree, um, we needed to make it really clear that this doesn't replace clinical judgment. So it's great to have consistency, but we also need clinicians to have enough knowledge to know when to think outside the box and when to work outside the framework. So that's why we just started this process in the first place. So the wound infection framework specifically came about because there was four main reasons. So we were patient safety as always was at the center of this and we wanted to improve knowledge and skills of clinicians. As Karen was saying, particularly linking this to AMS, we need clinicians to be confident and knowledgeable and be able to recognize those early signs of local infection so that we can ultimately try and prevent the need for antibiotic therapies. So we wanted to have patient safety at the center. We didn't want our patients de developing wound infections in the first place. And those who did, we wanted them um, identified early and treated early. A second thing was prescribing data trends. So we, have all, all organizations monitor this. And something that as a team, as a tissue viability team, we were always aware of dressing prescribing data trends. But what we'd never looked at before was antibiotic prescribing data. So this was something we didn't want to have a wound infection framework that impacted in a negative way on antibiotic prescribing. So that was really important that we thought about what prescribing data we were looking at. Um, silver spend, silver spend has been topical for years, years and years and years after that huge surge in silver use years ago. It, some of you might remember it got slightly crazy. You could even get silver pajamas, silver socks, silver everything. So, so silver spend has been monitored in a lot of organizations for many years now. And we've done projects in the past when we could see that silver spend was very high, we thought that's that can't be rational, it can't be necessary. So we'd done projects in the past and silver spend reduced. Um, it was all focused at that point on a financial impact and more thinking about appropriate use of silvers. But that project wasn't sustained, the success wasn't sustained. So over the years, the silver spend started creeping up again. So this time we wanted something that would sustain an improvement. So we wanted a sustained improvement in spend. We've got to think about spend and finance, but we also wanted to have that improvement in patient safety and infection management, and then linking it back to antimicrobial stewardship. So the final thing we decided to do as part of this wound infection framework was to standardize the first line antimicrobial dressing. So this is something we've never done before. We've always had quite a generous formulary from that point of view. Um, we always, um, we've got a huge team of very competent prescribers. So we always left it to them to make the decision, but spend was creeping up anyway, use was creeping up anyway, we decided that we needed to make access to antimicrobial, a antimicrobial dressing much easier. So there was always, always within the community, you always get those inevitable delays. Um, if there was no prescribers within the team, it came down to requesting from a GP, we had to go to a pharmacy, then had to be delivered. So there could be a delay of at least at best two or three days for a patient to get an antimicrobial dressing. So we wanted to have one first line dressing, which was much more available to staff. We wanted it to be much more standardized. So that's what we did. So when choosing the antimicrobial dressing, the one we want, we wanted something, bearing in mind our trust covers children's, um, mental health, adults, um, pregnant women, breastfeeding women. So we needed a product that would be suitable for everybody and would be harmless. So this is how, that was the main decision process around which product we chose. This was a huge, I'm kind of skimming through this, but please don't underestimate the amount of thought and discussion and research and trawling through evidence. And we looked at all the products and everything. And the reason we came 
back to the, the products we did was mostly to do with safety. It was just easy because we knew it would do no harm on all that, the whole patient population across the community. So our framework was uh, initially, bear in mind this was started in 2018. So it was based on the International Wound Infection Institute guidelines at that time, which was the 2016 document Karen referred to. And there was an awful lot of head scratching, awful lot of thinking about the evidence at that time around biofilm and biofilm strategies, biofilm management. So now there's much, it's much clearer and there's more evidence, but at that time we just felt that there wasn't enough for us to implement biofilm strategies across a large city, a large community trust, because we were worried, because we hadn't had anything like this before, we were worried if we changed too many things, we would have no idea which worked. So we wanted to keep this really quite simple and something we were very keen on was having clear, measurable outcomes so that we could measure the impact of this framework because we've implemented frameworks, flowcharts, algorithms, whatever you want to call them, before, but we've not really measured their impact properly. So we were very keen to make sure that we had clear, measurable outcomes. So the main questions and the main debate within our team, which was lengthy, this took many months, <laughs> lots of discussion, lots of reading, and the two main questions were, do we add an irrigation solution or surfactant and do we add a debridement pad or cloth? So we read all the evidence, we read the papers, we read the guidance, we discussed this, discussed this at length within our team. But we knew that despite all those publications and despite all the science, in practice we, were, we, could, we saw and we were told by staff and patients that sometimes wounds weren't being cleaned thoroughly and even not at all. So it just felt like too much of a leap to jump in with deprivement pads and cloths and irrigation solutions, including surfactants, when we knew that wounds, were, wounds weren't being cleaned at all. So we decided to be very conservative with our approach. So we'd done all this background discussion, we'd done all the research and reading around the topic, but we needed some structure. So. This is how we organised ourselves. We used the PDSA cycle from NHS England, and it just helped us to structure what we were doing, um, made us more organised, and it was really helpful. So this is how we structured our um, this piece of work. So this is the wound infection framework that we came up with. So the content and the language is pretty much lifted from the IWI document from 2016. Thank you, Karen. So we wanted to stick to those terms. We needed staff to know what these terms meant. You can see there's an alert box in the set in the center just to highlight for those immunocompromised diabetic patients who might be at further risk and need a different pathway of treatment. This linked really nicely in with the trust's work on sepsis um, screening and the work that other colleagues within the trust have been doing on um, picking up and monitoring the deteriorating patient. So this slotted in really nicely with other work that was going on with the trust already. So this is what we decided to do. I think the main thing is for us, we know it's conservative, um, possibly controversial, and that's due to that because we didn't include a debridement path or a surfactant. But we were really clear, like I've said, that we wanted to start small, start conservative, measure the impact and then progress it if needs be. So this is why we ended up like this. So at the time, we had some, there was concurrent changes within the organisation which really helped this project. One of the main ones were, was that unregistered staff were given camera phones. So this was part of a piece of work around pressure ulcer categorisation, just to help for accurate categorization of skin damage across the trust, but this really helped the infection framework. So staff could go out, take pictures, bring it back to the office and discuss it at handover. So there was much more accurate communication about um, wounds that they were concerned about infection. So that was really helpful to us. Um, we moved to a direct purchase scheme for uh, procuring wound products. 
So this meant that rather than waiting for prescriptions, the clinicians, community nurses, practice nurses were able to start an antimicrobial dressing that visit or that appointment. So community nurses, for example, would have these in their bag. If they thought the patient had developed signs of local infection, they could start an antimicrobial dressing that day. So there was no delays for the patient. So thinking back to that patient safety um, point right at the beginning, this was a really massive part of the success of this framework. Without the direct purchase scheme, I don't know whether this would have been as much of a success as it was. So these concurrent changes were really important. I don't want to undersell how much of an impact this had because it was instant access to these products. Um, and then, of course, it was training and education. So it's one thing as a team of tissue viability nurses writing a framework, using terms from documents. If the generalist clinicians don't understand it, don't know what things really look like, um, they don't understand the terminology. So like Karen's mentioned, the training and education was so, so important. So we started with monthly face-to-face -face training and then we moved to online. So each month, staff could drop into training. We covered all the primary care teams, all the practice nurses, all the community teams across the trust. And it was constant, constant training because as you know, trying to get staff released for training, trying to get bums on seats, so to speak, can be really, really difficult. So this was done every month, repeated across different teams, just so we could make sure that staff really knew what this framework was about. What we didn't want with this was that, because it looks quite pretty, very colourful, very lovely. What we didn't want is that classic reaction when you saw people in a new document or a flow chart and they go, oh, that's nice, yeah, that's really good. And then they put it in the diary and or save it on a desktop and it's never looked at again. What we wanted staff to do was to read every word and understand every word. We don't want staff to remember every word, but we want them to know it's there and know where they can access that information. So they need to... Part of the education was about teaching them to value the document just so that we could really show them this is what you need to know, this is what you need to recognise and this is what you need to escalate for the unregistered staff. So the training was absolutely essential. So our outcomes. So we were thrilled with this, as you can imagine. So these first few points here are certainly how to make friends within medicines management. So our silver spend in the first 12 months reduced by nearly 50%, um, which was phenomenal. Everyone was thrilled. So this is all coming from very much a finance point of view. So you'll notice thinking this back to the antimicrobial stewardship, this, these points are purely financial, but I'm going to come on to the relevance to antimicrobial stewardship shortly. So you can see the silver spend was reduced by nearly 50%. The total antimicrobial spend was reduced by nearly 15%. And interestingly, we had a small reduction, albeit in swabbing over 12 months, which was encouraging really, because we knew anecdotally that just in case swabbing was being done. Um, and we really, we took this as an encouraging point because part of the pathway was about appropriate swabbing and when to swab. So this was encouraging that there was a reduction in wound swabs, so we were pleased with that. But if we do talk about antimicrobial stewardship, we needed to be really, really sure that our rather conservative framework didn't lead to an increase in antibiotic prescribing. That was absolutely an essential part of this project because there is no point implementing any of these cost-saving initiatives if we are going to have an increase in antibiotic prescribing. So antibiotic prescribing data can be unreliable. Um, it can be quite difficult to pull off accurately. So we chose to look at two clear outcome measures for antibiotic prescribing. The first one was the number of items of flucloxacillin. So as you know, flucloxacillin is the most common antibiotic prescribed for wound infection, soft tissue infection, so we felt that number of items of flucloxacillin um, was a great place to start. So we would not want to see an increase in flucloxacillin prescribing. Um, the second thing we looked at, we 
gathered data on the number of antibiotic prescriptions which were linked to the read codes for wound infection or cellulitis. So this was the aim of this really was to try and pick up the other antibiotics, doxycycline, whichever that might be prescribed for wound infection. But because other antibiotics can be prescribed for so many things, we didn't want to monitor each antibiotic. We felt it was just going to be inaccurate, get too big. So for the others, we wanted to look at others linked to the read code. And of course, there would be some duplication. So there would occasionally flucloxacillin is prescribed with a read code linked to it, then it would be counted twice. We know it's not perfect, but what we could do is measure this consistently. So we knew it would let us monitor trends, although it's not 100% accurate from real prescribing data. So if we look at antimicrobial dressing spend, you can see here how in the first year, silver spend plummeted. All the others, so all the other kinds of antimicrobials which were being used across the trust stayed pretty constant. Um, and then our first line obviously increased. So looking at this, again, this is all about the finance. If I was going to do this again, so if you're thinking of doing the project similar to this within your organisation, my advice would be to measure spend, because it is important, but also to measure the number of items. Because what we don't know is, have we saved money because we have switched to a cheaper product? Or have we saved money because people are following the framework and using antimicrobial dressings more appropriately? That's what's missing. And that is what is really important from an antimicrobial stewardship point of view. So moving forward, we are measuring, we are counting, sorry, items as well as spend. And it just gives us more of an insight into appropriate use of antimicrobial dressings. So this is a total antimicrobial dressing spend. It's a rather unremarkable graph, but the point here is that it did seem to plateau. So within the first year, you could see there was a decrease of about £60,000. Um, again, is that just because we'd switched to a cheaper product or is it because people are using less? We don't know. That's why I want to measure items and spend. Then year two, we saved approximately £10,000 and then into year three, approximately seven. But this is um, sustained reduction in spend. But it, you can see clearly from here that it plateaued. So what we need to know is why has it plateaued? So has it plateaued because wound infection, the framework was a roaring success and this is just an inevitable level of spend for antimicrobials? Is it that all staff had been trained and everything was great? Or why was this happening? And I think one of the things we all, the elephant in the room really is COVID. So obviously during COVID training stopped, staff were redeployed, um, staff who wouldn't usually do wound care were doing wound care, for example, health visitors. Um, uh, so people who weren't as used to dealing with wounds were doing a lot of wound care in the community. And from what I, the staff that I worked with, they were absolutely fabulous. They had a very um, brief introduction to wound assessment, wound infection. They were taught about the framework, but it was that they were fabulous. But we have to recognise that these clinicians weren't used to dealing with wounds. So thinking about COVID, if you're looking at the antimicrobial dressing spend, you can see where COVID starts. So the training had stopped, but had the pathway peaked anyway? This is what we don't know. Would this have plateaued without COVID? But as I've mentioned already, without the number of items, we're not, it's quite difficult to know from an antimicrobial stewardship point of view if we, this was a sustained success. From a finance point of view, yes. But I, I'm not sure. I, COVID, of course, had a huge impact, but it didn't go up. COVID didn't lead to an increase in antimicrobial dressing use. So was it, would, would this have happened anyway? Would, has, had the pathway reached its peak? When you look at flucloxacillin prescribing, however, it is really clear when COVID starts. So looking at this chart, I don't want to mislead you, this wasn't a sustained month on month decrease in flucloxacillin prescribing. These are just total annual numbers. 
So the total number of flu cloxacillin items prescribed each year was, was reducing. But then in 2020, obviously increased. Interestingly, the January and February data from 2020 were continuing the downward trajectory. But then as from COVID onwards, it's increased. So this does reflect antibiotic prescribing generally across the organisation, all antibiotics, not just flu cloxacillin or those linked to wound infections. So all antibiotic prescribing did go up. The assumption is that this was due to an increased number of um, remote consultations, but this is, this is a problem. This is a problem from an antimicrobial stewardship point of view. It's a problem from a wound infection pathway point of view. So this is, we've got a lot of work to do now to pull this back from the impact of COVID. Antibiotic prescribing generally. So this is the antibiotics linked to the read codes that I'd already mentioned. As you can see, there wasn't a sustained improvement, slight increase in fact, after the implementation of the pathway, but then a decrease. But of course, it just rocketed as soon as COVID started. So this is what I find really interesting about this framework. Why did that go up? This is what I want to look into. And as this work goes in forward, we want to really look at antibiotic prescribing and try and make sure that there is no sustained increase. We want to bring this down. So this is the just a graphic really to show that the antimicrobial spends since COVID so it's up, down, up, down, but on, on general, it was decreasing. And this is what we need to maintain. So thinking about our next steps, um, it's how many years? It's four years now since we developed this framework. It feels like one, um, but we have the new IWI document, which was out in March that Karen's already mentioned, and it contains growing, the growing evidence base on biofilms. If you do anything from this presentation, read that document. It is incredibly helpful, very practical, and the pull-out section at the back that Karen mentioned is really, really useful. So that is a, a definite read. If there's, you learn anything from this um, session today, it's read that document. So for us, we're up, going to update the um, framework. We're going to base it, obviously, on the new IWII document. Anecdotally, we still hear about wounds not being cleansed thoroughly. But we're having those same questions. Do we add in a surfactant? Yes, probably will. Do we add in a debridement path or a cloth? Yes, but it's just planning it so that it follows the IWI document, the step up, step down process that Karen mentioned that's in the back of the document. But we also need to restart regular training. So, but we need to badge it differently. We can't just turn out the same training because people won't want to go. They think, oh, I've done that. And um, what's what's new? We need to make it fresh. We need to make it interesting so that people want to attend. Because without the training, it's just another pathway. It's just another framework, and it'll have no real impact. So thinking about impacts, this can't just be about the wound team. This can't just be about the tissue viability team. It has to be about the organisation. It has to be about infection prevention and control teams. And the leadership within the organisations are absolutely essential. There is no point trying to begin a project like this without the support of your senior and middle leadership. Because questions we need to ask, are staff overwhelmed by the library of frameworks? Do they find them useful? So these are the kind of questions we need to really ask. And of course, we have asked people but it's very difficult for a staff nurse to say to me to the face to my face no I don't think it's helpful Kate so um we need to do this properly we need to ask people do they find it useful because um it, it, some people really wouldn't want to say no it's rubbish to our face so we need to ask do they value them are they useful do they consult them or is it just another glossy card that gets filed away never to be seen again and the main thing for me really is do the leadership in the teams value them? So this isn't the senior leadership within the organisations because they're very on board with frameworks and standardising care. It's the middle leadership within the team because you can't rely on a team of specialists to implement a document across an organisation. 
it has to be valued by the people who lead the teams. So the people who lead the community nursing teams, the people who lead the um, primary care teams, if they value it, it will be much more likely to be embedded within their team. So for us, as a team of specialist nurses, it's relatively easy, thanks to Karen and the IWII for doing all that work, it's relatively easy to update the framework. It's really, we just copy the process that they've done. Um, we use the pull-out document at the back. It, updating a framework isn't difficult. The difficult bit is embedding the change. So a minor amendment for us, quite straightforward, a minor, a minor amendment for a city with 800,000 people living in it is huge. We need to, again, start that embedding process and form the leadership, re rejuvenate and liven up the training just so people want to attend. There's no point us just churning out another document which is not read. So that's the real, this is the real thing for me. If you're going to try and achieve any pathway or framework, whether it's going to have a measurable lasting impact, you can't do it in isolation. You've got to work with your infection prevention teams and you've got to work with your leadership and your trusts. So that is what hopefully we'll do. But that's me. Thank you. I'll hand you back to Sam. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. And uh, th thank you, Karen, as well. Uh, really, really interesting session there. And um, I know we've had lots and lots of questions come through already. Uh, so uh, I won't keep you too long. So we'll move straight on to the questions. Uh, I would just say to the audience, I, I, I saw a few comments coming through about the slides uh, and watching back the video. I know there's lots of information. Uh, so the slides and the video are both going to be available on our website uh, tomorrow. So uh, the link for that will be in the uh, in the comments section as well. Uh, but you can find that at woundcare today, woundcare-today.com as well. Um, okay, on to the first question then. Uh, Kate, you've um, you've pretty much finished on this question, but uh, Karen, I'll, I'll ask it to you. Um, but the first question is, how can I implement uh, an AMS pathway? Interesting, Sam, because it's quite difficult. It's quite different, sorry, for each area because you need to, exactly like Kate says, you can develop a pathway, but how do you get it implemented? I think first and foremost is to find out what do people know about antimicrobial resistance, first of all, because if people haven't heard about it, there's no point implementing a pathway because they'll just go, yeah, it's really good, but I don't know what you're talking about. So it's always good to do focus groups, maybe with staff, or just ask a few staff, what do you know? How does it affect you? And then implementing the pathway is all about education and looking at what's on your formulary as well. People generally like something that says, this is what it is, and this is what you need to do in different circumstances. But you must link it in with the formulary within the area that you're in as well. No point saying you can use this antibiotic and this antimicrobial if you can't actually get hold of them. And also your pathway should go across the spectrum. So community across into acute as well. I'm very much aware of with the ICS is now to ensure that your GPs and your practice nurses are all involved as well, because we've got to try and close that loop. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to question two, uh, Kate. Uh, I'll go to you first on this one. Would, would you advise to use an antimicrobial dressing for a wound infection instead of an oral antibiotic? I think with this, you need to look at the criteria within the IWI document. So you need to be really clear, is this local infection or systemic infection? Because we don't want to be prescribing antibiotics for local infections. So for me, this is about getting really confident in the signs and symptoms of local infection and knowing when to start an antimicrobial dressing. But then if the patient is systemically unwell, they most certainly need antibiotics. It's that confidence to know the difference between the two. So I would really do some reading, again, back to the IWI document, it's all in there. So really learn about those signs and symptoms of local infection so that you can be confident saying, this is local infection, I know what to do, I need to start an antimicrobial dressing. But then it, obviously we have to be monitoring for systemic infection. Is the patient unwell? Are there OBS within normal range? So it's 
it's all about being confident with the difference between local and systemic infection. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so on to question three then. Uh, for cellulitis, we are being guided to long, we are being guided to long-term management of this with antibiotics, especially in lymphedema. What is your opinion on this, Karen? I'm going to hand that one to Kate because she's far more clinical than I am. <laughs> I think, yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have to be very clear here. The long-term prophylactic antibiotics is just for lymphedema, not for things including lymphedema. So there is a BLS document about managing recurrent cellulitis. So it's very important that these complex lymphedema patients are seen by specialist team who are very skilled in managing complex lymphedemas. So yes, for some complex, lymph yeah, I can't say it, complex <laughs> lymphedema patients, they will, if they've had recurrent episodes of cellulitis within 12 months, then yes, the guidance is to give them prophylactic antibiotics. But what we need to be clear on is when is that reviewed? That can't be lifelong. So when is that reviewed? When is that stopped? Those patients still need to be having expert lymphedema care. They can't be just discharged with um, antibiotics, but ineffective compression. So it's a whole, the whole suite of lymphedema treatment needs to be there, not just a prophylactic. But I think the, doc, the guidance you're referring to is the BLS document, but that's just lymphedema. I wouldn't be using prophylactic antibiotics for anything else. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so question four, you talked about non-medicated wound dressings. When should I choose these? Uh, again, look at local formularies as well, Sam, to see what's available, because we can get Kate and I can give loads of advice and then you can't actually get hold of something because you don't have it on your formula. However, there's a really good document, the World Union of Wound Healing Society's document has done one on medicated and non-medicated wound dressings. But it's looking at, to try and link in with antimicrobial stewardship pathways, it's about looking at the suite of dressings that we have. So you don't just have to go, for example, for your silver-based dressings. You can look at these that don't have an active ingredient, so they work with that hydrophobic, and they pull it out of the wound into the wound dressing. It's not, we talk about antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship, but you can't think of it in isolation. And I think Kate said that with the lymphedema side, that's really quite different. You've got to manage the lymphedema and think about antimicrobial stewardship. When you've got an infected surgical wound, for example, that's much easier to manage because that's acute and you know that you can help resolve that. So it's looking at, it's always looking at it holistically, but definitely, ensuring that the infection prevention team, your microbiologists and everybody are on board with this so that you can see that you can have a choice of different products and a choice of different antibiotics to manage most patients that will come through the door. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we've got time for uh, two more questions. So on to question six very quickly. Uh, what is your experience regarding silver dressings and resistance? Oh, are we talking about experience or research, really, Sam? <laughs> well, I mean, you could touch on touch on both if uh, if you could. That'd be amazing. From a research point of view, there's lots of um, information out there, and it shows quite clearly that there is a place for silver. But it's looking again at your patient, and it's a pro it's effective assessment and appropriate management of looking at your tissue biopsies or your wound swabs, for example, and using them correctly and not using for the just-in-case scenario. So <clears throat> patient goes to the theatre, comes back, you think, oh, I'll just pop this silver dressing on. Just in case the patient gets infection when they go home, that's not what they're there for. So that a lot of have been used inappropriately in the past. So again, it's an assessment. Kate? Not much to add, really. I think for me, clinically, you can't say that you see you don't see silver resistance. You see there's products that work on some people, don't work on others. But is that resistance? You could argue either either way. 
but that's the same for any of the antimicrobials i think for me it's like karen's saying it's just knowing when to use them and whichever is on your formulary go for that but then knowing do i need to try something else but we need to remember as well that this is this is great but if you haven't got your underlying diagnosis right in the first place these mm -hmm. wounds aren't going to progress so always be thinking have we got the diagnosis right are we missing something do we need to get a biopsy is it you all, always be thinking about potential of infection and antimicrobial stewardship but you always for all wounds need to be thinking is this diagnosis right have we got this right in the first place and it's biofilm management as well sam that people need to think about and the fact that you can't see that biofilm with the naked eye and the IWII document goes through all about biofilms as well but again it's cleaning the wound and making sure that wound is clean amazing thank you both uh, so we'll move on to the to the last question question number seven uh, how do you involve leadership in wound care projects great question I think you have to be salespeople for wound care projects. So wound care is huge. Wound care affects, particularly in the community trust, a large proportion of the community nurses work. So if you are within a specialist team, you can't be precious about this. You can't be the only ones that are good at this. You have to really sell, sell the benefits of an increased knowledge across the board. So within the leadership teams, it's very easy to sell initiatives on pressure ulcer reduction, for example, because it's measured, it's monitored, it's a quality issue. So linking in with your infection control teams, if you want to try an initiative to engage leadership in an AMS project or an infection pathway, wound infection pathway, you, you need to talk to the right people and you need to make friends with them. <laughs> they need to like your project. So you need to sell it, you need to pull in people on, who will support you. Uh, so your infection prevention control teams, for example, this can't be just a wound issue. It's got to be much bigger because it affects everybody. And wounds aren't just treated by specialist nurses. So I sell think it. Okay, it makes a good point about pressure ulcers you can measure. And it's about having some quantifiable data that you can collect and say that we are making a real difference here rather than just saying oh we've stopped using all these dressings or well, so what what's happened we need something that we can measure and we're we're very good at collecting data sam we're not that good at analyzing it and using it in a sensible way sometimes amazing thank you both uh that was uh that was really insightful thank you so much for uh for answering all of those questions i know there was uh there was lots of them um so uh thank you both for the presentations as well thank you st too for supporting the event and thank you everyone for sending in your questions for tonight's speakers uh we do really appreciate you uh spending your your evening with us as well uh so st do have uh lots of uh support and educational tools including path education uh, which will show a short video at the end of the session uh, once I've uh, once I've given the certificate links and things. Uh, they've got bite-sized learning, they've got support with pathway development as well. So to find out more about their products, Cutimed Sawbacks, for example, um, you can get in touch with them on concierge.service at sct.com or speak to your local SET account manager. Uh, those uh, the contact details should be in the comments as well, so uh, you can't miss them. Um, and now the certificate link should also be on the screen and in the comment section. Uh, there's lots of uh, different links going on in there, but uh, they'll all be in there and they'll be pinned by, uh, by our team so that you can definitely see them. As I said earlier, the recording and the slides will all be available on our website tomorrow. Um, and uh, make sure you do follow our, our Facebook page so you don't miss any of these future events uh, and any announcements as well. So that's all from us. Thank you again, Kate and Karen. Amazing session. Uh, thank you, ST, and thank you everyone for watching. We'll now leave you with that short video uh, from ST about the PATH platform. So please do enjoy that and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>